In our previous video, we explored NoSQL injection, but as non-relational databases continue to rise in popularity, and with the recent release of Portswigger's NoSQL injection labs, it's a good time to revisit the topic. We'll do a short primer as usual and make sure that we have an understanding of what's happening under the hood. And then we'll work through a lab to see how we can use some basic fuzzing to detect this vulnerability and then continue to dig deeper and fully exploit it. As always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe and let's dive in. So first up, we're going to install and explore MongoDB a little bit here in Kali. And the easiest way to do this is by using Docker. So we can just pull the image down and then we can run it and we can drop into Mongo SH. So if we just do sudo docker pull, and I think it's MongoDB dash uh, slash uh, MongoDB dash community dash server like this, give it a second to download, have some coffee while we wait. All right, and then we just sudo docker run and we're going to call it mongo and then we want mongo slash uh, mongodb, sorry, mongodb slash mongodb community server. And if I recall, the version of Ubuntu we want is 5.0. At least that's what's on the documentation on the website. So quickly before we run this, if you come over to mongodb.com, you can find lots of tutorials how to get up and running with MongoDB and including installation across basically any operating system that you need. But in this case, I think Docker is the easiest way to get started. Be good if I could spell, but uh, it's pulling down the rest of the things we need to run this. All right, and this is done. So we can use sudo docker ps, oops, ps dash a to list the containers that we have running. And I have a bunch of things, but the one we're interested in here is this MongoDB one. And I can grab the container ID from here. And then we can sudo docker exec dash it, put in the container ID and drop into a Mongo shell. And here we are, good to go. Easiest setup ever. And with this method, we don't have to worry about clogging our VM up with tools and we can simply discard the container when we're done. If you do want to run it locally, once again, go back to that website that we just looked at and all of the instructions are in the documentation there. So let's explore a little bit. You can see that it's dropped us into this test DB, but if we use show DBs, we can actually only see admin, config, and local. And this is because whilst test is the default DB, it doesn't actually yet currently exist, but it will be created as soon as we insert a record. So we can view the current DB like this. So it just returns test. And if you're familiar with traditional databases, Collections are like tables and documents are like records or rows. And we basically don't have columns, which is quite nice. So let's switch to a different database and insert some data. So I'm just going to say, hey, use TCM. And you can see that we've switched to TCM. But once again, it doesn't actually exist yet. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go db.tcm.insert1. And then we're just going to insert a user with the name of Jeremy. So like this. And here that you can see that it's inserted a new object and it's automatically assigned an object ID. And now if we show DBs, you can see that the TCM DB does actually exist. And we can start to query this data. So we can do db.tcm.find, and this will dump all of the information out. And once again, you can see the automatically assigned ID and the name of Jeremy. So let's go ahead and add something a little bit more complex. So db.tcm.insert1 like this, and let's give a name of Jessamy, and let's do something like age is 25. And we can also pass in things like arrays. So we could do something like interests, and we can just do running, for example, and 
competitive programming like this. And once again, it's inserted and then we can dump all of the information and we can see we have Jeremy and we also have Jessamy with the age of 25 and an array of interests. So pretty flexible, uh, great way to just throw lots of data in and then you can figure out the rest as you're querying it or with your logic later on. Now for NoSQL injection, we often use and well abuse basically the operators that are available for us. And for example, we might use an operator to filter out results and say, hey, db.ttm.find, and then we might add something like age of 25. But if we wanted to get everybody that is older than 25, for example, we would do age greater than 25. And this won't return any results because nobody is greater than 25. But if we do greater than 24, for example, we get Jasmine returned. Or if we do greater than equal to 25, once again, we get Jasmine back. So now if we start to think about how these operators work, if we were able to inject into a password field, instead of passing password one, two, three, we might be able to pass something like the password is greater than zero, and that will probably pass the logical check. So let's demo this quickly with a new user. So let's do db.tcm.insert1, and their name is going to be Raj, and their password is going to be password123, very secure. And our login query might look something like db.tcm find one and we'd have something like the name is Raj and we would have something like the password is password one two three and this obviously passes the check because the values are correct but if you grab the name and the password from the user and inserted them into this query then you get hey one record found log the user in and of course if they don't know the password like this, we get null return. So the login would fail in this case. So let's inject an operator and say, hey, the name is Raj, but the password is going to be equal to, not equal to blank, for example. Or we could just go with not equal to QWE, QWE value that we know that the password is not equal to. And once again, Raj is returned. So here, we're using this operator to pass this check. And there are quite a lot of operators we can use. So for example, there's greater than, there's greater than equal to, there's less than, whoops, less than, and then there's less than equal to, and then there's not equal to. And then also we can do things like with an array or a list, we can say in or not in, or we can even do regex as well, which we'll see in the lab. Now, if you want to experiment a little bit more with MongoDB, and I highly recommend you do just to kind of get a feel for it. Uh, if we come over to here and come over to the mongodb.com once again, and then we've got slash developer products, MongoDB cheat sheets. Um, this is a great cheat sheet to kind of get started, insert some data, do CRUD operations, so create, read, update, delete operations. And you can see that also they're making use of these operators as well. So you can kind of see them, how they're used and how they're meant to work. And of course, this is a great way to kind of get up and running quickly. But I think that's enough theory and background knowledge for now. Let's go in and take a look at the new Portswigger Labs. So this is the lab that we're going to be starting with. We have exploiting NoSQL operator injection to bypass authentication. So let's go ahead and access the lab. And it's worth noting that we also get some credentials for testing as well. So we'll just keep that in mind. So if we come here and we have, we like to shop and we have a refine your search. So accessories, clothing, corporate gifts, we might come and have a look at this and fuzz this and see if we can find injection here. But since it says, hey, your objective is to log in as the administrator and do the login bypass, we're just going to focus on the login form. All right, so let's just do test test so that we have a little bit of data in our proxy. It's always nice to have a clean request to work with. And then also we want to have a look at Dina and 
pizza and have a look at how the application behaves. And we have asd.asd.com, this looks like it works. And then we can log out again. So next up, what we do is we come over to Burp Suites, come over to HTTP history and kind of take a look and see what's happening. So usually I'd like to switch these filters on so that I can see everything. And the ones we're interested in is these login post requests. So we can take a look at this first one, which is probably the test test. So if we need a clean request, we have that there. So I'm just going to send that to Repeater. And then we also have the successful request as well. And we get a HTTP 302 found. And so this is quite useful to know so that if we're fuzzing or if we're throwing payloads, as soon as we see a 302, we might have a potential login. So now we know how the application behaves when we get a successful login and we know how it behaves when we get an unsuccessful login. We get a 200 OK for unsuccessful and a 302 found a redirect when it's successful. And then after this, you can see that we get a My Accounts and also the username is passed in as the ID parameter here. And this is interesting. If I saw this in real life, I would then start trying to fuzz this, see if we have idle vulnerability, but that's a little bit out of scope for now. And then if we need to, we can come into the, the change email and have a look at some other functionality as well. So let's come here and let's just send this request so that we have one request and response in here. And probably what we're going to do actually is instead of testing for this manually, we're going to fuzz because oftentimes you'll have a large application and you'll have a lot of endpoints and you'll have a lot of parameters and a lot of places where you potentially have injection and testing them all one by one manually for injection and all sorts of other issues is not always very practical. So let's just jump straight to Intruder, Control I, and here we are. So we can scroll down. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to update this. So this is Vina. And I'm going to try and see whether we can fuzz the password field and so that we can get either an error or an issue. And then we come to payloads. And I don't think Burp Suite has a built in payload list for no SQL injection, which I can't see when I can see like a standard SQL injection here, but this probably doesn't include no SQL. So let's come over to here and just open up a new tab. And I'm just going to CD into user share sec lists. And all I'm going to do is instead of going through all of these different folders like discovery and fuzzing and, and things like this, I'm just going to do find dots. And then usually I do dash name, but in this case, we're not sure on the syntax of the file name. So it, we might be looking for something that's like no SQL I or something like no SQL I or something like this. So we use I name to ignore capitals. And then all we're going to do is type in no SQL like this and hope for the best. And here we are, we find buzzing databases, no SQL. So probably the quickest way to find a word list in cyclists is just using wildcards and using lowercase file name match. So let's come back over to here and then let's load and we want to come up from the IOCs into setlists and I think it was in fuzzing databases and no SQL. And let's simply start this attack. And I've just remembered something that is something that you should always try and remember. And that is if we're attacking something in the URL, we probably need to encode it. But if we're attacking things and our payload is in the body, we may not necessarily have to encode our payload. And you can see that we have status code 400 for all of these. This is throwing an error. And yeah, we get invalid JSON. So let's just close this quickly, come back over and come down to payload encoding. And we want to uncheck this since our payload is in the body of the request. So it's down here rather than up here in the URL. So let's start attack again and fingers crossed. And if you recall, we saw that a 302 was a success before 
And looking down the list, we have a 302. Of course, we can filter by status codes. So if we had like 10,000 requests, we'd obviously want to just see the outliers, like the lowest and the longest and things that respond differently. But the length and the response code is different here. And as you can see, we have the greater than, which we used in our example earlier. And this looks like it logged in successfully and it's being sent to the same place. So we can verify this quickly. We can just come back to here, come to my accounts and then Athena. And then we're just gonna put test. And then all I'm gonna do is come to proxy, intercept, intercept on, send this. And then we want Let's switch it to raw, it's a little bit easier to work with. Greater than, blank, switch this off, and then we're logged in. So our payload works, awesome. So now we want to do the same for the administrator. So let's log out again, come to my accounts, come to administrator, test, intercept is on, and probably we can, I should have just copied and pasted it and put it on my clipboard to save a little bit of time, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. Like this. And here we get invalid username and password. And I struggled for a little while with this when I was first doing the lab because I assumed that the administrator username was administrator. And of course, you know what happens when you make assumptions. Everything always goes wrong. So what we actually needed to do is try and figure out what the administrator username is. And eventually I found that we could use regex and guess the first part of the username and then that would log us in. So if I come back to repeater, the final payload after quite a bit of manual testing. Let's come back to raw once again. We had our password bypass, so greater than nothing. And here, instead of administrator, we had regex and then used admin star like this. And if we send this, you can see that we get 302 found like this. And all I'm going to do is grab this payload, copy it. Once again, just switch on intercept, test test, login, paste it in here so we've got it in the browser. And here we get, congratulations, you solved the lab. So there's actually quite a bit more to NoSQL injection. There are a few different techniques, quite a few ways to manually find and enumerate and exploit NoSQL injection. But I hope this gives you a good starting point and there are a bunch of other labs to play with as well. Now, there are some other great labs to work through and in particular, the data extraction lab is a lot of fun, so I definitely recommend you give them a try. And that's it for this video. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. See you next time.